This is Adjuster TV, Adjusters First. This video is sponsored by Adjuster Pro. Use code ADJUSTERTV at checkout and get licensed right now at adjustertv.com slash licensing. Okay, so what are some traps in the policy that could trip you up as an adjuster and that could make it to where either you get the file kicked back for a correction and maybe you have to call the homeowner back and say, hey, I made a mistake and it's actually, this isn't covered for this and it's only covered to this limit and it's actually, you're only gonna get this much money. Um, or that the customer could rely on and that could end up uh, in a much bigger mess. So the first basic trap is something called personal property replacement cost. Many, and it uh, all depends on the state and the policy, and we're talking about homeowners like an HO3 or an HO5 policy. Um, they will have, generally an HO3 policy may have personal property as actual cash value only in the policy. But when homeowners sign up, and this goes for a lot of endorsements and, and things like this, when a homeowner buys a house and signs up for homeowner's insurance, they will often, or should every time, it's some, in some way or another, whether it's online or on the phone or in person, have a conversation with the agent, right, for the insurance company, whether they're like a direct sales agent who is you know, like a State Farm agent who only sells State Farm, or they're an independent agent who sells a whole bunch of different companies' uh, insurance, right? No matter what, whenever they say, all right, well, we think that such and such company is the best for you, and this is the policy that should work best for you, they will ask the homeowner a series of questions about things that, that they want or don't want covered based on whether or not the homeowner thinks they're gonna save some money on their premium, right? The less coverage you have, the cheaper your insurance is gonna be generally speaking, right? So one of those is personal property replacement cost, right? So like I said, the a lot of HO3 policies, and it, again, it depends on the state, it depends on the company and so on and so forth. It's This is why you have to read the policy and get to know the policy um, because you don't know if it's gonna be one way or the other. Like I said, they will make a personal property replacement. The personal property is covered for covered losses, you know, and excluded for other losses, et cetera. Uh, but, if, but the payment for those under loss settlement will be actual cash value only, meaning that if, like if you have a fire and you have a $1,000 computer and it's a five-year-old computer and it has a 10-year li average lifespan, it's an average condition, right? Then there'd be 50% depreciation as an actual cash value or ACV on that personal property item. If they don't have personal property replacement cost coverage, then they're only gonna get 500 bucks, right? They're not gonna get, be able to get the second $500 once they replace that item. And the way you know whether they have it or not is by looking at the deck page. Um, and a lot of times the deck page can be found in exact analysis. Um, it can be found uh, by reaching out to your IA firm team manager or some sort of like IA firm support person who's responsible for getting you that, things like prior claims and deck pages and things like that. <clears throat> um, sometimes it'll show up on your loss notice or your first no first notice of loss, like loss report thing that you print out from, from Xactimate. And it'll say, you know, PPRC, END 400, com, whatever, like W slash H um, 1%, things like that, right? PPRC is personal pro property replacement cost. Um, most people, the vast majority of homeowners, when they sign up for homeowners insurance, will say, yep, I want that one, right? And in the vast majority of cases, if they decline any coverage like that, they will have to sign a piece of paper that says, I understand uh, what this coverage is for, and I understand um, the consequences of declining personal property replacement cost coverage, right? And they'll sign it and date it, right? And it goes in the file. And the reason why I say this is because one time, years and years ago, I had a claim where the homeowner had a very large outbuilding um, that they were using as a garage. It was big enough to park several cars in it. It was like a 40 by 60 or maybe a 40 by 60 by 100. I, it was a big building, right? And they had a tractor in there and they had cars and lawnmowers. And they had like everything that they, uh, that they owned that they had accumulated through the years and they were using it as a storage unit for, the, for themselves, right? So it was full of stuff. There was a fire and the building burned down and everything in it was lost. And they had a nice house in a nice neighborhood and they had drove nice cars and so on and so forth. And I 
assumed, just because it was such an uncommon thing, that this was gonna be replacement cost, and it wasn't, right? And so the conversations that I had with the homeowner uh, included me saying, oh, and as you go to, you know, continue to replace these things um, from your shop, the things, the personal property items that were lost, um, just send, us, send me the receipts and I'll, I'll you know, cut you checks for the replacement cost part of that. So at some point, I think there was a, because it was a pretty big, fi- a pretty big claim, obviously. Um, at some point there was a, my manager reviewed it and came to me and said, hey, um, did you know that they don't have a PPRC on this on this particular policy? And I called the agent. I got on with the, the attorney for the insurance company and my manager and everybody else. And we had a big meeting about it and I messed up, right? And it was kind of a sticky situation and not pleasant. Having phone, every phone call that I made to the insured after that was not a good time um, because I had to basically tell them that I what I said before wasn't really the case. Um, and so on and so forth. So I'm not going to get into too gory details on that one, but suffice it to say, it was extremely painful, it's extremely time consuming, and it really damaged the relationship between the customer and the insurance company, right? Because I screwed it up, right? More or less, in, in a certain way. Um, so that's the first trap, right? Personal, price, personal property replacement cost, PPRC. Uh, may go by other names, uh, but you always is one of those just like mental check things, right? And you'll have things like this happen throughout your career where you make a mistake on something and then you go back and you, you know, that's that's something that you always check, right? Um, another one, and this is, again, these are all, almost all these are basically in, like endorsements. Um, there may be a situation where the uh homeowner or the property owner isn't really taking very good care of their house, uh, or they maybe uh, take take okay care of their house, but they kind of don't really pay much attention to the roof on the house. And so the roof is year after year after year, it gets older and older and older, and it starts to deteriorate, right? And maybe it's 20 years old or 28 years old, and it's, it's really only got a 20-year average lifespan, right? It starts to fall apart. The insurance company may say, you know what? The older that roof gets and the more deteriorated it gets, the higher the likelihood, the higher the risk statistically, right? The higher the probability that uh, even a small storm or lightish, like, you know, not like gale force winds, but like lighter winds could blow, start blowing shingles off that roof and it doesn't look like it's repairable. And uh, so we don't want to have that extra risk. So the underwriting team at the carrier might say, um, you know what, uh, we're going to amend this person's policy and say, everything else is fine, um, but until you have your roof replaced, we're either not going to cover it at all, or it's we're going to cover it only at actual cash value, right? Until you can show proof that you had the roof replaced, right? Which is a bill from a contractor and maybe a picture, right? One snapshot just showing, here's what it looked like before, here's what it is now, right? And then they'll take that right off of the, the, the policy or off their, yeah, basically off of their policy. Um, this is, you, you know, you might on the one hand think it's a little bit egregious, but if you read the policy, which again is an agreement between the two parties, part of the responsibilities of the homeowner or the policy holder, or if they're a business owner or whoever, right? As the policy holder, they're responsible for maintaining their property properly, right? Um, they're sort of falling down on that if they just let the roof go and just wait for the insur- wait for a hailstorm or like high winds or whatever to start blowing shingles off and then file a claim for it. Insurance company is not really excited about that kind of thing, right? So they're going to, you know, it depends on the company, certainly, but they will, I think they will um, probably uh, be incentivized to uh, look for those kinds of ways to reduce risk, right? And that's, that's what insurance is about. It's a transferal or the reduction of risk for both sides, right? Um, the third one is something that, uh, unfortunately, if when you're looking at your loss report, you got a whole big stack of claims, um, that unless you know what it means or what the sort of lingo is or the acronyms or whatever that they're gonna use, um, they, depending, and this depends on the state, um, they may have what's called a wind hail deductible or a cyclone deductible or a hurricane deductible or a wind deductible, something to do with like high winds, right? And this usually is in states like Texas and Florida where they're kind of the target of major hurricanes and things like that. 
in order for the, and the reason why insurance companies will do this, and it's higher than their normal deductible. So if the house burned down, right, just because there's a fire, then $500 deductible on the whole thing. But if the house was destroyed by a hurricane, super high winds or whatever that came through, then they might have like a 1% or a 3% or a 5% a hurricane deductible or a wind deductible, which would be much, much greater than 500 bucks, obviously. And, you know, again, at first glance, people might say, well, you know, the insurance companies are evil and rotten, and they're just doing that to try to... What's really happening is, is that because the, the margin, the profit margins for insurance companies, believe it or not, is less than 10%, um, the insurance company is always trying to keep seven, six, seven, eight percent, nine percent of of a profit margin so that they can pay their stockholders and, you know, do whatever they want to do with the with the profits. Um, right. And then but if they if they're operating in a state, especially a heavily populated state, where there are frequent large hailstorms or frequent hurricanes and things like that, where the the profit margin disappears and all of a sudden they're in the black and the, or in the sorry in the red in that state by you know ten percent thirty percent, a lot of insurance companies have gone out of business right because of operating in states where they have high high likelihood of almost all or many of their their policyholders um, filing expensive claims and then they can't do bus- they they can't do business. Anymore, they can't even the the percentage that they go over, like their their total revenue that they pull out of that state, goes over so far that they can't even pay the bills at the at the offices that they have in the state. Right, that's how far down it goes, and those those companies spin out. Um, a lot of companies, especially after big hurricanes in 04 and 05, pulled out of places like or tried to pull out of places like Florida, because they're like, hey, we can't we can't afford to do this. We will go out of business. And nobody will get it. We won't be able to operate at all um, if we try to continue to do business in that state. And the states are like, well, 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 hold on a second. And so they make concessions to the insurance companies. And one of those is having a much higher deductible, right? Because again, we're talking about transfer of risk. That's the whole point of insurance, right? As a homeowner, you're transferring your risk over, you know, to the to the insurance company you pay as basically a subscription for them to take on the risk right well if the risk is really high here then you're going to have then the homeowner is going to have to take on more of the risk which means a higher deductible that's the basics of how it works if you turn in a claim and you don't understand or you overlook it or you're rushed and you're just kind of like blast through this thing and you put $500 deductible on it because that's their fire deductible that's their main deductible and they, but they have a 1% um wind and hail deductible, um, and you tell the homeowner, yeah, we'll take your $500 you know, deductible off the top and blah, 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 and your first check's going to be for this much, and your second check's going to be for that much, and you you missed that there was a wind and hail deductible on there of 5% or 2.5%, whatever it is, right? And it would actually be a $13,000 deductible, right? Hopefully, the file review is well-trained enough that they're going to catch that before the claim goes too much farther, Right, and maybe before you have this conversation with the homeowner, and they're going to kick it back and say, "Hey, listen, there's this this policy on the deck page, and on the, the first notice of loss is showing a, you know, if you do the math on it, it's thirteen thousand dollar deductible. Your manager might call you, right, and say, hey, listen, you can't, you got to change the deductible, right? And if you've already had a conversation with the homeowner, you're going to have to call the homeowner back and have." A different kind of conversation with them, right? And then a lot of people are gonna be like, oh, okay, yeah, you know, I kind of figured that. I was wondering, you know, maybe that was a mistake or whatever. And other people are gonna lose their minds on you, and they're gonna yell and scream, and your phone's gonna catch on fire, and your ear will be burned. And so um, these are the three basic um, sort of we call them traps, but they're they're really only traps if you are stumbling along blindly, if you're in a rush and you're not paying attention, uh, or you don't know about them, right? And this is why. Good training is important, right? So that you can you can know these things. And a lot of these things you'll learn when you go through the carrier certifications uh, at the I firms, right? So if you want to get State Farm certified, if you want to get all state certified, so on and so forth, um, you can't do it through me, you can't do it through MoCAD or Voss or anybody else. You can only do it through the IA firms, right? So the IA firms that have the contracts with State Farm or Allstate or whoever will be the ones that you'll have to connect with in order to sign up for the carrier certification trainings, and usually those are like a couple of days to maybe one to four days at the most, right? And they may have an exam at the end of it. Um, and maybe we'll do it remotely, or you may have to go to Atlanta or Dallas or 
wherever, right, or Mobile or something. Uh, but you got to take those. If you want to have the most opportunities, you got to get carrier certified and they're going to teach you a lot of this stuff. So there's a lot of little details and things like that that can kind of like, you know, clothesline you and, and uh, make what could have been a simple claim that wasn't super duper time consuming then take days or weeks and be lots and lots of phone calls and lots and lots of upset people and lots and lots of um, talking people back from the edge and, you know, trying to like really put the, the, the uh, you know, put on your absolute best customer service, we're so sorry, kind of like attitude. Um, and you don't want to do that because when you're doing, especially when you're doing cat property field claims, this is a, it's a volume play, right? I say it all the time. So and anytime you trip up and have a claim take more than the average amount of time that you want to spend on each claim for a little bit of a mess up on your part, then it totally wrecks everything else, right? And then you, you start kind of losing money because you're not able to close as many good, solid quality claims in the same amount of time because you're spending a lot of time cleaning up a mess that you made because you just weren't paying attention or you were rushed or you just didn't know, right? Did you know that this is just a clip of a much longer video? To watch the whole show and for a chance to have your questions answered by me, become a member at AdjusterTVPlus.com.